Okay, it's my honor to introduce James um, McClintock, who is the Endowed University Professor of Polar and Marine Biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. His research has been continuously funded the past 30 years by the National Science Foundation and focuses on aspects of marine invertebrate nutrition, reproduction, and uh, primary Antarctic marine chemical ecology. So as a result of his most recent expedition, which is ongoing and has taken place over the past two decades, uh, Jim and his research collaborators have become world authorities on Antarctic marine chemical ecology and drug discovery. This research has encompassed studies of the impact of rapid climate change and ocean acidification on Antarctic marine algae and invertebrates, and the expedition led to the development of an award-winning interactive educational outreach website that I showed you yesterday. And just on the personal note, we've been collaborating with Jim and his research team on uh, using some of his science to hopefully uh, make a difference in neuroendocrine cancers. Uh, Jim is the author of two books, Lost in Antarctica Adventures in a Disappearing Land and A Naturalist Goes Fishing. So in 1998, the United States Board on Geographic Names designated the geographic feature McClintock Point in Antarctica in honor of his contributions to Antarctic science. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome uh, James McClintock up uh, to the podium today to give us the uh, inaugural Stuart uh, D. Wilson uh, lecture. It's an honor to, to be here and to have a colleague uh, and a friend, Herb, invite me to do this and to be the first uh, speaker for this new named uh, lecture. The really neat thing about having a point named for you is that in my entire life now, I will never, ever be pointless. <laughs> All right, now figure out how to do this. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Green button. I will never forget the first time I put a dry suit on as a graduate student I dropped through eight feet of sea ice through a hole that was about three feet in diameter into water that was minus 1.8 degrees centigrade. My heart was racing. Dropped down below the ice and it was unbelievable. I was at McMurdo Station, the largest American station in Antarctica. I could see almost a thousand feet underwater the clearest water in the world. And even more stunning was that the bottom of the sea was covered with life. Sponges and soft corals and starfish and sea urchins as far as I could see. How did these organisms live in this rigorous environment, these cold temperatures? I spent 10 years working at McMurdo Station, studying chemical ecology, studying marine nutrition. And when I used to go to the cafeteria, I'd hear people talk at McMurdo about this other station, this American station called Palmer, it was mentioned almost with a sort of a, a reverence, a Shangri-La, a small station perched on a point on the Antarctic Peninsula, that 800-mile length of land that sits below South America. Well, guess what? My research eventually took me to Palmer Station, and for 20 years I've been working there. I had no idea at the time that I was moving to one of the most rapidly warming regions of the planet. And although my focus at that time was not on climate change, I couldn't help but get involved in learning more about what was going on. So what is going on? Well, if you look at a National Geographic back in 2006, you can see that most of the focus was on the Arctic. Scientists really hadn't started to parse the data and look to the Antarctic. Only the Antarctic Peninsula at that time uh, was considered to be warming. But when you really started to look at the data more closely, here on the cover of Nature uh, about 10 years ago, you can see that it's the western portion of the continent that's warming, not just the peninsula. And remember that you're looking at a continent here that's the size of India and China combined. Well, more recent information indicates that the ice shelves, these thousand foot thick layers of ice that are attached to the land of the continent, are beginning to melt. And it's not just to the west, it's also to the east. So all of Antarctica is beginning to show some effects of warming. So how much warming are we talking about? Well, 30 miles from where I work at Palmer Station, there's a Ukrainian station. It was formerly British, 
And for 60 plus years, they've taken daily air temperatures. And if you look at that data over that period of time, we're looking at about a 10 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature over that period, about a degree centigrade per decade. So this really makes this region of the world perhaps the most rapidly warming place anywhere, a model to study rapid warming. So what does that mean? Well, I can tell you from personal experience that when I arrived at Palmer 20 years ago, about once a week, there would be a tremendous crash. You would leap up from your desk, you would run down the hall, look out into the bay, big waves would be coming down. We would be sort of jockeying for position to watch them through the, through the door. When I was at Palmer two months ago, this was happening two times, three times a day. The Antarctic glaciers along the peninsula are receding. Now, we have more data than anecdotal observations of running down the hall. Uh, this is a science technician with a backpack with a GPS in it, and they go out every few years and they do a hike along the leading edge of the glacier. With the GPS talking to a satellite, they can pinpoint their position within a centimeter. And they come back and they draw another line. They draw another line to show how the Mar Glacier has been receding over time. And in that little inset, my colleagues, Chuck and Maggie Amsler, who showed up there in the early 70s, they said you could almost open the door of the station and step onto the glacier. And now it's a half a kilometer hike. If you look at this aerial photograph, uh, you can compare where the glacier was in 1975 with 2013 uh, and how close it was behind the station. We also have satellite-generated data uh, that looks at glacial ice thinning. Remarkable that a satellite could carry an instrument that can measure the thinning of a glacier to the accuracy of a centimeter. Those red areas would indicate, as I told you earlier, that it's the western portion of the continent primarily and the peninsula that's warming. And Greenland is shown uh, as well, another uh, place where we're having a lot of glacial melt. So, this was a surprise. Um, scientists had not anticipated discovering that the Thwaites Glacier on the western side of the continent was undergoing remarkably rapid recession, um, really setting records. And the concern here is that the Thwaites Glacier is effectively a cork. Remember, Antarctica is covered with two to three mile thick ice, all right? 70% of the world's water is locked up in that ice. It's so heavy it actually sinks the continent, it depresses the continent. That ice is not stationary, that ice is moving. On the western side of the continent, it moves to the west, on the east to the east. And where it's moving to the west, it's funneled through the Thwaites Glacier area. And the concern about losing the Thwaites Glacier is the rapidity, the rate of movement of that ice sheet into the water will be accelerated. And that leads to sea level rise, something that we're all concerned about. Now, there are also ice shelves along the Antarctic Peninsula, and I want to show you the fate of several of those. This is a map that shows them over about the last uh, 30 years where they've broken out. If you go back uh, a little bit in time, the Larsen B ice shelf over on the eastern side of the continent um, was imaged by satellite on January 31st, 2002, and you can see these striations in the ice. A month later, the entire Larsen B ice shelf began to disintegrate, and two weeks later, it did. It went out to sea. So this is a piece of ice, and remember this ice is about 1,000 feet deep, um, about the size of the state of Rhode Island. More recently in all the news, um, the summer before last, uh, the Larsen C developed a big crack, and eventually that area that you see in color there floated out to sea as one of the largest icebergs ever recorded. Um, it was the size of Delaware. And down at the base of the Western Peninsula, the Wilkins Ice Shelf has been disintegrating now for about a decade, um, and it's sort of dangling to an island. Eventually it'll go out, and this is a piece of real estate the size of Connecticut. So these are very large events happening along the peninsula. The good news is that when ice sheets melt, um, they do not contribute to sea level rise because it's the same physics as a glass of ice water. When the ice melts, the water doesn't come over the top of the glass. Um, so that's good. The concerning news is that we've discovered that these ice sheets serve as barriers to the movement of ice from land into the sea. 
And in the absence of these ice sheets, that, that ice is the acceleration of the ice can be four times greater. So that is contributing to the calculations for sea level rise. As much as a, about a third to a full meter of sea level rise by the end of the century. Something to be concerned about if you live in Miami, where now even on beautiful sunny days at high tide, you can have seawater uh, in the streets. So these are some of the things that are happening with the ice. What's happening to the life? This amazing ecosystem that characterizes the Antarctic Peninsula and that I've been very fortunate to study. Perhaps the most poignant story I can share with you today is the story of the Adelie penguin. Um, the, the individual in the back of this image, um, Bill Frazier, is a good friend of mine. Bill came down to Palmer Station as a graduate student 45 years ago. For his doctoral project, he tagged 15,000 breeding pairs of Adelie penguins. And Bill has come back every single year since and followed those penguins. He's become one of the most uh, well-known uh, penguin biologists in the world. Well, what's happening with Bill's penguins is concerning. Um, the purple line are Bill's penguins, and you can see over on the left-hand side when he was a grad student in 73, the 15,000 that he tagged. And off to the right, um, he told me now that this past year, uh, they're down to 1,100 pairs left. So uh, more than 90% of those Adelis have disappeared. Unfortunately, they're not moving. They're literally disappearing. Uh, we know that because they don't show up at other rookeries with tags. Interestingly, at the same time, the chin strap penguin in the top right picture showed up uh, in the 70s. There's, you notice that the right axis is a smaller numbers, but there's about 300 breeding pairs of chin straps. And then the gentoos, um, they roared in, uh, and they are now up to about uh, somewhere around 1,000 breeding pairs of gentoos. Now, why these two brush-tailed penguins have appeared is interesting. They don't really belong here. Um, they're warmer weather species that live up in the sub-Antarctic that are moving in as the Antarctic Peninsula is rapidly warming. So their range is extending, if you will. So I know you're curious what's happening to Bill's Adelis. And ironically, as it's warming, the air is becoming more humid. And as it's more humid, it snows more than it used to and somewhat later. So the Adelis are genetically hardwired to show up at the same time every year and lay their eggs, and then they get buried by these unseasonably late snowstorms. And sadly, when the snow melts, the eggs drown. So you can lose an entire generation of penguins in these increasingly late snow events. The other thing is that the sea ice, now I haven't mentioned sea ice yet, but every winter, the size of Antarctica doubles by the formation of ice around the continent. It's about three or four or five feet deep. It's not a, it's not a real thick ice. Um, this sea ice is so regular and predictable that a number of species have sort of uh, evolved their ecology around the sea ice, and the Adelie is one of those. The Adelie uses the sea ice as a surface to toboggan across, and get out to the ice edge to feed on krill. Krill are the quintessential base of the food webs of Antarctica, those shrimp that are so very, very common. In fact, if you look uh, underneath the sea ice, you can see the krill balled up when they're teenagers feeding on diatoms uh, under that ice. Now the problem is that the, now with the sea ice disappearing, the Adelis have to swim much further offshore to get to their food, and Bill thinks they're on a very tight energy budget, and this could be having a negative effect on the, the success of the chicks. All right, well, if krill are associated with sea ice, then they too are somewhat threatened in this scenario. And that means that all of the filter feeding organisms that feed on krill or catch whole krill are, are potentially involved, including the baleen whales. The good news is the baleen whales are coming back. On this last cruise, uh, I lead a cruise to Antarctica every year for the general public. Um, it's a philanthropic cruise, I'll mention it later. But on this last cruise, we counted 75 uh, uh, beautiful humpback whales in one day. We watched them bubble feed. 
where they dive down under the water and they blow a cylindrical uh, area of bubbles, a cylinder of bubbles that traps the krill inside the cylinder and then they take turns lunging up through the cylinder of bubbles coming out of the water and you can watch the krill being sieved across the baling. It's absolutely spectacular. Other species that are associated with sea ice could be impacted. This beautiful seal, the Waddell seal, one of my favorite seals in Antarctica, has the most amazing adaptation. The female has ice chipping teeth. When she's pregnant, she swims up under the sea ice and finds a weak spot. And she begins to chip at that spot until it's large enough that she can literally crawl up onto the ice and give birth. Her pup's completely safe from leopard seals, from killer whales out along the sea ice, and all because of her dentition. It's remarkable. Well, I don't think the Waddell seal is going to disappear uh, as the sea ice does. I think they're probably going to follow the recession of the sea ice. What about the Antarctic leopard seal, 10 feet long, 1,000 pounds, by far the most ferocious territorial predator in Antarctic waters. In fact, when we see a leopard seal and we're diving, we have a, a siren that we drop into the water immediately to let the divers know it's time to get up quickly. Um, they come by you underwater closer with each pass, uh, but they're beautiful animals, beautiful animals. Um, leopard seals have never been seen giving birth anywhere but on an ice flow associated with sea ice. So nobody knows if leopard seals are going to go to shore and give birth or not. That question is open. What about the small things that live in the water? What about the plankton? How are they responding to this very rapid warming? Well, this fellow in the middle, Hugh Ducklow, is a professor at Columbia and a good friend of mine uh, who's been the director of the National Science Foundation's long-term ecological research program at Palmer. They've studied the plankton along the coast of the peninsula for over 30 years. They've taken a ship each year for six weeks and run these transect lines all the way up and down the peninsula, sampling all sorts of things, water chemistry, phytoplankton, zooplankton, the list goes on and on. There is a huge database. So I asked Hugh if he would put that all into one slide for me so I could share it with you. And essentially, what he's finding, as you can see in this cartoon, is that the big picture is that the peninsula is shifting from a polar climate to a warmer, more humid, sub-Antarctic climate. The top two panels compare the 70s and 80s with the 90s and 2000s for the tip of the peninsula. Here's where the changes are most uh, obvious. The weather's changing, it's windier. The wind is churning the ocean and pushing the phytoplankton deeper, where they're having a tough time getting enough light to grow and, and be successful. Some of those phytoplankton are the favorite food of krill, and so the worry is that krill populations will take an impact from that too. Unfortunately, salps are moving in to replace the krill, little gelatinous organisms, tunicates, um, they, unfortunately, are like lettuce, replacing krill, which are like steak. Further down the peninsula, we don't see as much change yet, but Hugh thinks it's just a matter of time uh, until that is very similar. So what other things are happening as it warms? Well, I can tell you one thing today. I can tell you that there are forests in Antarctica. All you have to do is put your dry suit on with me, slip into the water in front of the station, and we will be swimming among 150 species of seaweeds. Some of them will be, you know, towering over your head, 30 feet over your head with blades as long as 10 feet. I think these forests are going to do very well in a warming world on the peninsula because you're not going to have the sea ice, you're going to have more light. The forests are going to extend to deeper depths. They're probably going to extend their range further down the peninsula. But we also know from our own studies that these seaweeds, all the dominant seaweeds, produce chemical defenses. And they need them. They're living in a soup of crustaceans that want to eat them. What's going to happen if they have more light? They're going to have more energy. They're going to produce more, perhaps different chemical defenses. And we don't know how that might affect the community dynamics. So there could be effects in that regard. What about the 
offspring of starfish and sea urchins and sponges and corals. We call these larvae. These larvae in Antarctica take three, four, maybe even five months swimming around in the, in the water column before they sink to the bottom and metamorphose into a juvenile. This little sea star larva that you're looking at, uh, we've studied. We know that if you collect these larvae and you bring them in the laboratory and you raise the temperature just a couple of degrees centigrade, instead of developing in four months, they develop in four weeks. They are incredibly temperature sensitive. They have never encountered temperature changes like this. So that might be a good thing. You might be thinking, well, <clears throat> they're up in the water. They could get eaten by a fish. Now they're only in the water half the time or a quarter of the time. Um, on the other hand, a lot of these larvae are feeders. They feed on phytoplankton. And the phytoplankton bloom at a very specific time of the year. What if they show up at the cafeteria and the door's locked? What if they're offset from their food resources? And this is something that climate scientists who study all different ecosystems are worried about, is the offsetting of predator and prey. This is a little graph just to show you that the, the dots uh, over on the left, the big steep line dots uh, from Antarctic species compared to the central dots from temperate and a one tropical dot over there. Um, this is time to hatching for embryos, just to accentuate how sensitive polar species, Antarctic species, are to temperature change. You change the temperature a little bit, has a huge effect. Now, I had mentioned earlier that there were a couple of species that had moved in. We had been joined uh, by uh, chinstrap penguins and gentoo penguins. Well, we have also been joined at Palmer Station over the few, last few decades by elephant seals. Those big seals up on the left, they get huge, they get several tons. Um, they've moved in, they've established a colony. You can hear the pups barking in the distance. They're, they're giving birth, um, and they're there to stay. Um, unfortunately, on a warm summer day, if you have 10 of them in the middle of the station, it's incredibly odiferous. Um, but that's life. They've extended their range. The fur seal, the Antarctic fur seal, another sub-Antarctic sub species, has arrived. Um, they haven't established a, a breeding colony yet, but we think they will. Um, so that's, these are range extensions. And probably the most poignant range extension I can tell you about today, I'll set the stage with this slide. You're looking at the seafloor of Antarctica. It is an ancient, ancient community. This community was established 45 million years ago when Antarctica separated from South America and allowed the establishment of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current that goes clockwise around the continent. This is the world's largest current. That effectively locked Antarctica into a deep freeze. The species that were there that could adapt to the cold did. Many went extinct. There are some very conspicuous groups that are absent. Uh, there are no sharks in Antarctic waters. Uh, there are no fish with crushing jaws. All 250 species of Antarctic fish are wimps. They have weak little jaws. They feed on little tiny crustaceans. There is nothing in the Antarctic Sea with a claw. There are no crabs. There are no lobsters. So these organisms that you're looking at have evolved over a very long period of time in the absence of any type of crushing predator. So they're vulnerable. I could, I could hand Herb an Antarctic clam, and he could take his two fingers and just crush the shells. They're very thin. Things are very weakly calcified. So you can imagine the shock of my colleague, Sven Thatchy, who on January 25th, 2007, uh, was sitting 1,123 meters above this image in a ship flying a remotely operated submarine up the slope underwater slope towards Antarctica. And for the first time ever, he found crabs, king crabs, 13 adult king crabs on the slope. This created a lot of interest because scientists have known for a very long time that king crabs live in the deep sea around Antarctica. But as you go up the slope, it actually lowers the temperature. And as you lower the temperature, king crabs don't do well. King crabs effectively act like they're drunk at low temperature. They fall over. They can't feed themselves. They miss their mouth. It's essentially the inability to regulate magnesium ions in the hemolymph that 
creates sort of a narcotic effect. So the thinking is that now that the deep waters around Antarctica are beginning to warm, we could be opening the proverbial curtain, the, the physiological curtain that is allowing king crabs to move up. So a colleague and I, Rich Aronson, wrote a grant proposal to the NSF to study this phenomena. And while our NSF proposal was being considered, another group of scientists just bumbled into one and a half million king crabs in a very deep canyon within sight of Palmer Station. Now they were very deep, they were not on the slope, but it just goes to show how poised they are. Well, we got funded. We've taken our, this ship to Antarctica three times now. And what we do is we lease a submarine from Woods Hole. We tow the submarine behind the ship up the Antarctic slope and onto the shelf in 10 kilometer long transects. And we do this at a variety of sites. Now on the submarine are two cameras taking images of the seafloor about every 15 seconds. So you can imagine how many images we had to analyze to see whether or not there were king crabs present. When you have tens of thousands of images to analyze, you use something in science that's extremely important called the graduate student. <laughs> um, and we have lots of graduate students, and we've, it was wonderful. So we now know that the king crabs are on the slope in millions. They have not reached the shelf yet, which is good, and we're hoping that they don't. The last thing I want to mention is ocean acidification, the poor stepchild to climate warming. It doesn't get near the publicity of global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it. But a third of the carbon dioxide that we've added to the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution has found a home in the world's oceans. The oceans have become 30% more acidic as a result. So if you build a shell, even behavior, even physiology now has been demonstrated to be affected by ocean acidification. The Antarctic is the canary in the coal mine for ocean acidification because the colder the water, the more soluble CO2 is in it. So it is the place to study ocean acidification. So you can go to the Antarctic oceans today, not a hundred years from now, today, you can dip a little sea butterfly, this beautiful little mollusk, the size of the tip of a pencil. It has a beautiful aragonitic shell, and they're as common as the stars in the sky. In fact, they're part of our global carbon cycle. And you can see etching on the shell in certain regions of the Southern Ocean where the shells are dissolving from ocean acidification. So this is happening now. I had two wonderful young women doctoral students who spent two full seasons at Palmer Station, five, six months at a time, studying ocean acidification on mollusks and different types of calcareous algae. Um, and while they were doing that, they were living and working in this wonderful place that's my home, Palmer Station. Um, I always have trouble getting my graduate students to come home. They want to stay. Uh, you know, they have a couple of chefs. They've got whales swimming by the window. They're doing exciting science. It's great. Ocean acidification can also affect other organisms um, like this amphipod. Um, not this species, but another species we found they have a tough time dealing with it. This would, I want to just share this quick little story because it's a wonderful story of discovery. I was out on the ice at McMurdo as a young scientist and I happened to look down through the ice hole and I saw a little shrimp-like animal swim by with an orange backpack. So I grabbed a net and I picked it up. I took it up to the lab and I, uh, John Jansen, a fish biologist, and I put our heads together. We pulled the little backpack off and it opened its wings and flew away. It was a sea butterfly, a different type. It doesn't have a shell. They're called naked sea butterflies. So we put nets around the sound. We caught hundreds and hundreds of these little shrimp and almost half of them were carrying a sea butterfly. Why would they go to all the trouble? Well, if you took the sea butterfly off the back of the shrimp and you offered it to a fish in the lab, the fish would eat it every time. But if you left the little sea butterfly on the shrimp and you offered it to the fish, it would take it in the mouth and then it would go and spit it right back out. And this little shrimp would swim away very happily with its little captive sea butterfly. Well, it turns out that the sea butterfly has a chemical in it. We named pteroinone that tastes terrible if you're a fish. 
And so this is a very smart shrimp that had figured out it could abduct another species and carry it around with it to protect itself. And it was published in Nature because it was such an unusual and remarkable discovery. So this is a list of the things that I've been talking about. The recession of the glaciers, the ice sheets breaking up, the annual pack ice, those species associated with the pack pack ice having a tough time, the phytoplankton communities being affected, perhaps the forests, larval development, organisms moving into areas they hadn't been before, extending their ranges, king crabs, ocean acidification. Wow, what an amazing list for a period of just a few decades. So we're looking at a community that for millennia has looked like this. We had very dependable sea ice, we had a very uh, robust population of Adelic penguins, good numbers of krill, um, the seafloor communities, the, the forests, and this was all being fed by this very nutrient-rich water of the ACC, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And where we're going probably by end of century, maybe earlier, is we won't have sea ice anymore, we won't have Adelic penguins, We'll have Gen 2s and chin straps. The krill populations are going to probably be reduced. And we might have king crabs. And the forests will have ex extended their range. And again, this is all being fed by this Antarctic circumpolar current. Now, this is perhaps not a surprise um, that communities change. I mean, communities always change. But what's so poignant about this is it's happening so fast. It's happening in a period of a few decades, not thousands, not tens of thousands of years. And from a biologist's perspective, this is trouble because some organisms won't be able to make these changes. Some will, but there will be losers as well. So why should we care? It's a long way from Santa Monica to Antarctica. I can tell you, if I left the podium right now, it would take me a week to get to my station. I mean, I can't get there tomorrow. It, it is a, it's a long way. Out of sight, out of mind. Well, I could give you some aesthetic reasons why I think it's important to protect Antarctica. But let me give you a more practical one. Um, as we do our chemical ecology funded by NSF, we have a broader impacts component of that research, which involves drug discovery. And we have been doing this for about 25 years now. So when we're diving under the ice at McMurdo Station and we're collecting things like sponges and soft corals and organisms that we know are most likely to be chemically defended and have compounds of interest, we collect additional material that we extract to test for chemistry. Um, and we do the same thing at Palmer Station. So when we make these extracts, we have crude extracts, and then we also are identifying specific compounds. All of these are being screened by the National Cancer Institute, the Cystic Fibrosis Research Center at UAB. Um, Herb's been doing some work with us on this as well. Uh, all sorts of different screening programs um, for various types of potential drug discovery. Well, let me just tell you what we found over this period of time, just a couple of examples. We found a tunicate this blob-like organism that's actually on the same branch of the phylogenetic tree that we're on, um, this, this blob produces a compound we named palmarolide. We sent palmarolide off to the NCI. They screened it against 20 different types of human cancer cell lines, and they called us up. And they said, this is really exciting. We have activity against only one of the types of cancer, and it's very potent against that one type. Can we work on it? And when the NCI says, can we work on it? You say, yes, you can work on it. And they, they were able to produce palmarolide in the laboratory. Because you can't take ships to Antarctica to harvest the seafloor. So they made it in the lab. Unfortunately, a, a fairly detailed kind of thing. It was like nine steps. So not a great practical thing, but that's OK. Uh, recently, uh, one of the members of my team uh, and another colleague have figured out what gene is responsible for producing palmarolide, and there's every reason now with their NIH funding that they can figure out how to make bacteria 
make this compound, which would be absolutely fantastic. So who knows, someday we could have a potential drug to fight melanoma uh, from the Antarctic with a different uh, mode of action. This is a protein we found in an Antarctic seaweed that has anti-influenza activity, activity against the H1N1 flu virus, and perhaps our most exciting discovery to date, a recent discovery from an Antarctic sponge of a compound we've named darwinolide, which is active against the biofilm form of MRSA. Now, to our knowledge, this is one of the first, if not the first, compounds that has activity against the biofilm uh, form of MRSA. It doesn't have really potent activity, but the fact that it gets under the biofilm and has activity at all was extremely exciting, uh, as um, indicated by the huge number of downloads of the paper and the interest in the topic. And when I spoke at the, uh, grand, at the grand rounds of the surgeons at UAB, there was a lot of excitement because I guess if you're putting in an artificial knee, getting a biofilm forming and getting a MRSA that you have to clear can involve removing the implant and doing a second surgery. And I've had talked to surgeons who are doing this routinely. It's kind of scary. So my point is, what was that all about? The point is, we have a huge potential reservoir of chemical diversity in this seafloor of Antarctica. Why would we squander that to climate change? Why would we give that up? So I used to get asked this question when I toured uh, the country speaking about climate change. Is it really warming? I mean, I have not been asked that question probably in five years. You can go online and you can Google global warming and find tons of data to support that. But I want to show you my favorite data set that convinced me it has to be real. Nobody can take these data. These are what in science, in science we call these hard data. Yeah. So the, the question that everybody's kind of on board that we're warming. But the question I get now is, do we have anything to do with it? Isn't this just a natural cycle? The Earth goes through these cycles. Well, let me show you what convinced me. And it's actually fairly simple. It looks complicated, but it's not. You're looking at an ice core. You're looking at an ice core that's about the diameter of a grapefruit and goes down 30, what is it, 3,600 meters through the ice. This is the ice cap sitting on top of Antarctica. So as you bring that ice core up in sections, there are little bubbles of air trapped in the ice that were formed at the time that that ice was formed. So we're looking at an ice core that goes back 420,000 years here. And you can go, you can take those little air bubbles and you can calculate, you can measure the amount of carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere at that time. And that's what's causing global warming. That's the, that's the greenhouse gas that we're most concerned about. Um, so that red line that you see going up and down over 420,000 years is the amount of carbon dioxide. The blue line is temperature calculated indirectly uh, with oxygen isotopes. But I want you to look at the red line. Look what happens to that red line uh, when you get over to the right, okay? And I've blown it up for you. That dark bar across the top there that I drew shows you that we've never had more than 300 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere over a 420,000 year period until we get to the Industrial Revolution. And when we get to the Industrial Revolution, uh, this needs to be updated. I think we're now up to about 408 parts per million. In other words, we've had more than a 25% increase in a very well-known greenhouse gas since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And you can make up your own mind, but as a scientist, to me, that says that we're having a lot to do with what's happening. I can't say it's 50% or 70% or 80%, but I do believe it's very significant. And if you wanted to know why there was that 100,000-year cycle in, in the warming of uh, the planet, it has to do with what's called the Milenkovitch cycle, which is a 100,000-year cycle with the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So at this point, you're thinking gloom and doom. But that's not what I want to leave you with today. I mean, that is really not why I'm here. I want to leave you with a message of hope. And ironically, it just so happened to happen about 20 miles from where I work in Antarctica. Uh, in 1985, there were two technicians sitting at the computer, and they looked at each other and they said, you know, our boss in England is not going to believe these data. 
And you know what? They were right. They sent the data back to England, and he said, I don't believe them. I'm getting you a new spectrophotometer. You're going back to Antarctica next year, and you're going to make the measurements again. And they found the same story. They couldn't believe it. And they published in the journal Nature probably the most important paper of the 20th century reporting a massive hole in the ozone over the entire continent of Antarctica, a hole that was so large that when I was on sabbatical in New Zealand about 15 years ago, when I would read the paper in the morning with my coffee, I would look at the weather section and they would tell you what level of sunscreen to put on that day as a function of whether the hole in the ozone had drifted over New Zealand. And New Zealand has the highest rates of skin cancer anywhere. So this is a big deal. The ozone protects us, biological life, from ultraviolet radiation. It can also affect climate. This was a global phenomenon. And you know what was more remarkable than the discovery was that in 1987, two years after the paper came out, 20 countries sat down around a table in Montreal, Canada, and ratified the Montreal Protocol that regulated the chlorofluorocarbons, the refrigerants that were destroying the ozone. Today, there are 197 signatories to the Montreal Protocol. It is by far the most successful global treaty of all time, and even better, it's working. Susan Solomon, the woman who discovered the chemistry behind the hole in the ozone, who's at MIT, told me that now they think this hole may close mid-century instead of end of century. And you know what? The companies that made the refrigerants did not go out of business. They came up with another product that doesn't destroy the ozone. So I just throw this out there as sort of an example of a model that we could use to address climate change. It's more complicated, as you well know, with carbon dioxide. So if I have just a, do I have a couple more minutes, Herb? Okay, let me just tell you about how I came about this process of outreach. When I saw what was happening in front of me, I knew I had to do something to reach a larger audience. And everybody told me, you have to write a book. And I found out to write a book, you have to have something called a literary agent. And then I discovered to have a literary agent, you have to have a book. Um, so I was very fortunate that um, I had invited perhaps the most famous living scientist today, E.O. Wilson, to my university. And I had nominated him for an award. He won the award, but nobody told me I had to take him around the entire week. I was his grunt. I picked him up at the airport. I took him to his meetings with the medical dean. And by the end of the week, E.O. Wilson and I, this famous Harvard professor, were friends and have been so ever since. And he knew I liked to write, and he was able to get me a literary agent. Um, and my book came out. Now, books are amazing things um, because you never know where they're going to lead. And when my book came out, Lost Antarctica, I got a phone call from the director of his institute, and she said, Jim, we just love the chapter on the Adelie penguin. We want to do a two or three minute video, um, and we're going to put it in the zoos and the aquariums of America. It's going to be very poignant. And I thought she was asking me to narrate my little thing, because she said, you know, we want to use your prose. And I, I offered, and she said, no. We'll have Harrison do it. And I said, Harrison who? And she said, we'll have Harrison Ford, of course. He's on the committee with you, you know? And so anyway, that was a wonderful thing. You can, go, you can go to YouTube and watch Ghost Rookeries, the wonderful little three or four minute video with, uh, with Harrison reading from my chapter. The other thing that happened related to the book was an interesting day I spent with this guy. Um, I was at the station at, at, at Palmer, minding my own business. And I happened to be sort of the senior scientist on station, so the program director there came to me and said, Jim, we're having a guest come tomorrow. Could you host the visit? I said, sure, who is it? I can't tell you. I said, you're kidding, why? Security. I said, we're in Antarctica. <laughs> so anyway, 
Bill Gates and his father, Bill Sr., and his stepmother and his son, Rory, arrived the next morning, and I spent the whole day with them. It was wonderful. We went around, and they learned about the science projects, and Bill was very curious about climate change. He wanted to know all about that. He asked if we had enough money. I blew it and said yes. Um, <laughs> and after lunch, it was my job to take Bill and his father up to the room where we have a big screen TV and we were going to show them the NSF video about what is the U.S. doing in Antarctica. So I went up there at lunch and I put two big chairs in the front of the room for Bill and his dad and they sat down and I was sitting behind them and in came the IT guy and he could not get Microsoft to boot up. <laughs> and his father looked at Bill and went, he said, you really need to do something about this. And I, I thought that that was my Microsoft moment. Um, well, the neat thing is that Bill um, left, and it occurred to me, I should send him the galleys of my book. He'll probably write something on the front of it or something. I could not reach Bill Gates by email. Imagine that. Um, so I did get to his dad, who got the book to him, and he did a very nice little jacket uh, cover thing for me. So how am I doing other modes of outreach? Well, 11 years ago, I sort of timidly accepted an offer to lead a climate change themed cruise by a very nice travel company called Abercrombie & Kent to Antarctica once a year. So every January for the past 11 years, I take uh, 200 people on the ship to Antarctica. We visit the station where I work because I'm on board, which is really cool. I get to show them a tour of the station. Um, I usually have my own personal group of folks that have come, kind of contacted me ahead. Um, and this is a life-changing cruise. I, I don't say that lightly. It, it's the most amazing thing you'll ever do in your life. Herb is coming with his wife, right, in 2021. So if you have any interest in doing this, do it. Um, and contact me. You, you can get in touch with Herb, and he'd be happy to make the, the contact. Um, I also buy a piece of scientific equipment. Everybody on board has donated $100, so I, they give me $20,000. We buy a piece of climate change-related equipment. The scientists come on board. We present the equipment to the scientists at the station who are going to use it. They give a PowerPoint about how important that's going to be to their work. It's a wonderful way of getting people involved in climate research. The other thing I've been doing is in the area of religion. I do live, I'm a Californian, but I live in Alabama and I've been there for 32 years. Um, and one of the things I did was to coordinate a workshop with a Episcopalian priest about the relationship between spirituality and climate. And this has been wonderful. Um, I think there's real potential. I recently was the keynote at several big uh, religious conventions in the Southeast. So I think that climate change has the potential to resonate as sort of something that fits into that care of creation uh, scenario and scientists have a role in this. And, you know, everybody always asks, what can I do? I feel so helpless. Well, I thought one of the best things anybody ever told me is you can vote. I mean, that, that's really where you have a real voice. Um, invest in companies that are using sustainable practices, these kind of, a whole sort of typical thing that you think of when you think of how you can make a difference. We all can make a difference. And I'll just uh, end by saying that the uh, Nature Conservancy uh, of the United States, um, a, a very large organization, has asked me to be the face of their uh, We Need to Talk Climate campaign. Uh, and it's a pledge. And the idea is that in the United States, we, we're not talking enough about climate change. So you don't pledge to give any money. I love pledges that don't ask for money. You pledge to talk to one other person within seven days of signing the Nature Conservancy pledge. And, you know, that's easy. And then it takes you to a website that tells you how to talk to Uncle Charlie, who doesn't believe in global warming one bit, and find common ground. And with that, I'll stop talking, and thank you very much. Jim, that was a fantastic talk. You might have to get a bigger boat uh, after this presentation than just 200. So we appreciate you taking the time uh, to give us and enlighten us. And 
Stu, uh, it's uh, an honor to have you present, uh, Jim, with this plaque commemorating this inaugural uh, lectureship. Thank you very much. You've turned everybody on here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stu. All right.